All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Hoots episode 45. Solve large volumes of metrics challenging with Istio Service Mesh and Open Telemetry. Istio supported metrics tracing and logs since the beginning of the project when we launched Istio, oh gosh, almost six years ago without application developer needing to do anything other than injecting the sidecars and then propagating the B3 trace headers. Well, telemetry works great for single clusters. How does work with massive volumes of telemetry for large multi-cluster Istio service mesh deployments? In this live stream, we will review some of the scalability challenges we have for collecting telemetries for glue mesh and why we decided to leverage open telemetry to tackle what scalability challenges and how it worked with live demos. So I am so excited to welcome Reno and Josh to the hood. So, uh, so you guys probably remember Reno. Reno was on one of our early hood uh, live stream, I believe, in April last year about yeah. the Istio in Action book. Uh, why don't you go ahead and introduce uh, to yeah, the so audience? I think it's my third episode with the hood, but I'm not so sure what was the other topic. Um, but I'm not sure, maybe it's just the second. So I'm Renor, I'm a software engineer here at Solo. I co-authored the book Istio in Action alongside with Christian Posta. And yeah, we were like presenting some of the chapters of the book last time. Awesome, thanks so much, Reno. So excited to have you. Uh, Josh, go ahead, give us an introduction. Oh yeah, I'm, <clears throat> I'm Josh Pritchard. Um, I work here at Solo Software Engineer on the Glue Mesh team, and this is my first time on Hoot, so I'm excited to be here. Yeah, we're very excited to have you too, Josh. Thank you so much. And let's say hi to our audience. Uh, Peter, thanks so much for joining. And uh, Bongjian, thank you so much for joining. We're excited that you guys are here. So feel free to let us know if you have any questions. Uh, with that, oh, by the way, I have one big news I, I would like to announce. Um, so Peter actually wrote a blog about this. Uh, let me send in the chat. Um, so on Friday, Istio Ambient Service Mesh is merged to upstream Istio. So what does this mean? This means Istio uh, 1.18 is going to have Istio Ambient. Whenever we release Istio 1.18, so you can already grab one of the Istio's uh, develop builds and try Ambient yourself. So you no longer need to build Ambient uh, to follow up the latest development. And in fact, um, Peter actually wrote a blog about this uh, just over the weekend, um, which I will put in the chat uh, for everybody. Um, to if you are interested to learning a little bit more about Istio Ambient um, graduate out of the experimental branch and merge to Istio master branch. All right, uh, with that, uh, I'd like to start um, to discuss with Reno and Josh. Can you describe what scalability challenges do you have? Um, yeah, so, as we're gonna as we're gonna show in some of the content we have, um, a lot of the scalability challenges we had um, with our existing system had to do came more with restrictions in flexibility. Um, so the o open telemetry allowed us to create a pipeline and implement a pipeline that ended up because it was separate and because it was more flexible, it allowed us to to just build it in a way that where it had a better scaling factor. And we'll demonstrate that as we go through it. Okay, uh, is there anything you want to add, Reno? So um, there are six points uh, when we go to the slides, but just to not repeat ourselves, uh, let's leave it when we go to the slides. Or if you want okay. then, oh, you know, yeah, yeah, let's, uh, let's pull out the slides now for, <laughs> for that particular one, because uh, if that's easier to describe. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I, I want to go through like um, a little bit of our old pipeline, and I think that will help uh, highlight the challenges that Open Telemetry ended up solving. 
um, we'll go through how we applied it to our product. And then even on top of that, like the, as far as the scalability aspect, Renora has a great demo to, to show us exactly what we can do and how it's actually applied to um, a running system. So um, I'll continue where I did the intros. All right, so um, I wanna give a little background before we jump in too deep. Um, so one way that Envoy can export metrics and propagate metrics is by using um, something called the Envoy metric service. So this is really just an interface that can be implemented through their public library in any and registered with any GRP server. Um, so right here is a very small, like zoomed in example of like a potential Istio workload with an Envoy sidecar running. Um, and that can be configured to just push via GRPC um, to any uh, red, like any Envoy metric service that's registered with GRPC server. So this will come back in as we look at our, our actual like product um, pipeline. So the and Envoy metric server could be running on the node um, the, the sidecar is running, the workload is running, or it could be outside of the node? It's, it's outside of it. So it can be anywhere. And I'll show, I have a small example here of how it's, um, how it's configured. So when you're configuring your mesh, um, you can add a singular like Envoy metric service. So for a given mesh, you can export that data to that mm -hmm. like Envoy metric service. And in our example, um, in our, our infrastructure, that is our glue mesh agent. Um, that is has that registered Envoy metric service and can is has the ability to receive that information. Um, not to dwell on this slide too much, but it does help highlight how generic this feature is. And I I, I do want to show it because it's an incredibly useful feature. Um, it's very open ended, so you can you can implement this anywhere. And with the Envoy's open source package, and just be, if you all you do is implement this interface and you can you're, you have a stream and you have the raw data um, it's extremely flexible so you can use this for anything in any custom application however with that flexibility it also doesn't come with a lot of like uh, baked in things that hotel does that we wanted to make use of so we'll kind of show the pros and cons of it being very just open-ended like this um, going to our infrastructure um, to really zoom back at a high level. This is that connection that we were just showing between a workload and Envoy sidecar. It's pushing gRPC data to the glue mesh agent, which has that um, which has that Envoy metric service registered there. Um, so from here, it's using the same exact mechanism. We're actually using an Envoy metrics client to then publish to an Envoy metrics server. Um, to the glue management server. And that is then exposing the metrics to be scraped via Prometheus. Um, this, is, this is great in some ways because it's so simple and you can implement anything on top of it. It's really easy to install. The traffic is all um, secure via gRPC. So there's a lot, of, there's a lot going for this. Um, one big issue with it is that, like a big con of it for us is that it's coupled to our product. And we don't want the glue agent to be um, coupled with the metrics pipeline. And same with the glue management server. We shouldn't have to scale our product components because uh, the metric components need to scale further. Right. Um, and I'm also going to go into some other cons. Um, any questions, Lynn, before I continue? Yeah. So, so basically, you are saying uh, because of the glue agent, uh, if there's a need of volumes of metrics uh, increase to a bigger degree, then you would have to kind of scale up glue agent and also the management server to accommodate the increased uh, volume of metrics which you don't necessarily want to do that, right? Because uh, that component, the agent and management server handles many other things in addition to the metrics. Is that? Exactly. The, we didn't, we wanted to um, separation of concerns there. And if that okay. was the only problem with this setup, um, we would have maybe split that off to its own service and still done it the same way. But there's a lot of other benefits to like Otel we'll go into, but that is a, a big driver of, a big driver and a big 
factor when talking about the scalability of it as well. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, so that is the key challenge. Okay, can you describe what solutions you have uh, reviewed and how you land up with the new architecture? Yeah, so um, we we evaluated um, a couple things, but like we we definitely landed on Otel pretty quick, um, mainly because we were getting a lot of um, feedback from our field engineers. They love using Otel. Um, there's actually some examples of it being used manually to implement like our metrics pipeline out in the field. Mm -hmm. um, so it was right at the top of our list to, to evaluate um, because of the requests and the pushback um, from the field. And it, it ended up just being great advice because, you know, once we once we really dug into it and tried to tried to make sure it was solving every one of our problems, tried to break it, tried to push it to its limit. It really just like exceeded our expectations and did everything we need. So um, that we, it, they made it easy for us with the right advice there. OK, very cool. Uh, do you want to review the new architecture briefly for the audience? Yes. Um, so before I before I go on to that, um, I want to still talk about a few. Um, I just want to prime it with a few of the other reasons that that old architecture was bad because we're going to solve it all with Hotel, right? Um, so we there's no simple f approach for forwarding data to customer backends. So we could forward to our own management server, um, but we couldn't like forward to other existing customer backends like different cloud provider backends or um, like Splunk or Datadog, right? Mm -hmm. Then um, we talk about we talked about the scaling being coupled together. Um, another big one related to forwarding that data is the transformations were directly in our application code because we were just reading from that stream directly, um, and it's not easily reproducible or exposed to the user for them to even know what's going on there. Um, and then advanced resiliency features uh, that old approach definitely um, definitely puts it uh, the burden on the developer to build in any kind of resilience. We did, but um, when you're doing that, it also feels a little like you're reinventing the wheel. Um, Otel has a lot of support here. Um, so, and it just comes baked in automatically. So we wanted to leverage that. Um, all right. So, um, before, again, before we get into the new, uh, architecture, I want to prime with just a little bit of, uh, knowledge of Otel because we're going to be talking about some of these concepts a lot. Um, and open telemetry hotel, hotel for short. Um, so before we get on to the right, the left here is an is a example of what a configuration file would look like for configuring the hotel collector. And the reason I'm showing this is because it really highlights well the four main concepts. And these might sound a little abstract at first, but there's four things, receivers, processors, exporters, and pipelines. And so you can configure receivers, processors, and exporters um, to do the different job of like receivers are either br are bringing in the data from different types of sources. They can be push or pull. Um, processors are transforming the data and exporters are writing it out to whatever destination you want. Um, these are reusable. So when you configure one, it's not actually doing anything until you put it in a pipeline. So down here, I have a theoretical pipeline where I've combined this receiver processor exporter. This concept is very important, though, because it we have like baked in when we're, during our installation receivers, processes, exporters. Um, the exporter goes to our backend, right? Um, mm -hmm. But it's really important because users could easily just write their own little pipeline to reuse our receiver processor and just add their own exporter. So it becomes really simple for them to like get that data exporting to their own telemetry backend. So I wanted to highlight this because that's how that's how hotel solving a couple of those problems we highlighted in the last slide. Yeah, can I ask a quick question in the context of Istio, uh, the receiver, can I interpret that as, I guess in the sidecar world, right? The receiver would be, uh, it would be scraping like 15020 port uh, and slash metrics. Is that the right way to think about it? So the receiver is a receiver is very generic. So you can have a bunch of different receivers. You can have receivers that are pulling information from different sources. You can have receivers like the one we use, Prometheus, that is um, 
that is scraping. Um, and you can have receivers that, that actually are just listening for information to get pushed to them. Um, so the hotel framework is extremely generic and these receivers can really be pretty much anything a developer wants to make them to be. Um, right. Um, so there's a lot of variety and I, I think, uh, Renor is going to show us, like, if we have time, he's going to show us a few more examples of this too, so we can get more ideas of like what that can do. Um, and even our application gives a few of these examples. Uh, just to on this side, all I really want to show out of this is some of the really important processors, which are batch attributes and filters. So batch are batching up the messages, so it's more efficient to send over the wire. Attributes drop. I mean, I'm sorry, attributes relabel metrics. So just like Prometheus would, like you can relabel um, your metrics and then filters can drop metrics that you don't want to use or you don't want to forward. Um, so continuing on, um, why open telemetry? We've answered a lot of these questions already. Um, I just want to highlight a few are that it's, it is easier to collect from other components because of a variety of receivers we don't just want to collect from Istio workloads. We don't just want to collect from Istio D. We also want to be able to collect from optional components that can get installed by our product. So this allows us to easily like add those different types of collection in. Um, we touched on pretty much everything else here, except um, the Otel collector builder. And Renor is going to go over the scalability. But I. Next thing I do want to show is Hotel Collector Builder. And I'll be very quick on this one because it's not terribly important, but it is it is a big boon for maintaining the Hotel Collector if someone decides to go down this path. Um, so um, we have a question coming. If you can take it, that's uh, from Benjamin. Does it support only metrics, or does it do tracing as well? Yes, um, Open Telemetry supports tracing. I skipped over that a little bit right here, but it supports uh, tracing and logs as well. And okay, which cool. is another big benefit and we wanna go in that direction um, in our application as well. Okay, cool. Thanks so much for that question. Go ahead. Um, yeah, so for the Open Telemetry Builder, um, this is, I wanna highlight this because it was really cool for us. It allowed us to manage much, much less code when implementing this pipeline. Um, so the open telemetry builder is used to in, for the open source to build its images and binaries that it ships through the public chart. Right. So, but it's also well documented in how to do this. And all they use is really like a template file that imports all of the processors, exporters is all separate components. All they're all like plug and play optional components. Um, so basically what we're able to do is use this builder add in our own custom processor because we have our own processor for some uh, metric transformation that we needed for application that wasn't supported with an existing processor. Um, but we were able to write a very, very minimal amount of code, basically append our processor to the normal open source template YAML and end up with a collector that can function exactly the same as the open source one, but also has our extra like processor baked in there. And um, I don't want to go into the processor too much because like Renor, again, is going to show this in the, in the demo. But I did want to highlight this because it manages, it allows us to manage much less code for this rather than forking and managing our own distribution. Yeah, that's really cool. So um, yeah, to get to the architecture at a high level, um, rather than data flowing between the agent and the glue server now for metrics, we have it going between the hotel collector and the metrics gateway. One thing I want to um, highlight and emphasize is that just like we were talking about with that hotel collector builder in the last one, we're building our own image, but these are exactly the same image under the hood. They're just configured for sep for completely different purposes. And that's, it highlights really well how flexible the open telemetry collector can be, right? Um, so the Otel collector on this side, we've configured it to run as a daemon set. So we get that automatic scaling factor per node. So it only collects metrics from the node that it's looking for. And then we've also, uh, it's collecting from Istio workloads, Istio D, custom application metrics from our agent, and then other static services that we may optionally install. So um, this then is communicating via gRPC to 
the metrics gateway, which is just another hotel um, collector, but it's deployed as a deployment. So it's load balanced through a load balancer and it can talk securely over gRPC to the collector that could, which is important because this could very well be over the internet, depending how um, the clusters are set up, right? Um, this then just for, allows the metrics to be scraped directly to this Prometheus. Um, you can see here that the minimum metric set is uh, emphasized here because we're filtering down to the only the metrics we need in our UI. Okay. That way we don't overburden Prometheus and we allow it to scale uh, better. Um, this, in our experience uh, in testing, um, this metrics gateway and hotel collector can far exceed um, anything Prometheus can handle. Um, so it's important to like only send the metrics we need um, on really, really big setups. Um, this Prometheus could end up needing to be more of like an enterprise installation. Um, so then also I just want to highlight, we mentioned this before, but like the match or metrics, maximum metric set, it's very easy for like customers to just add a new pipeline and ship actually all the metrics if they want to their mm -hmm. own like um, Splunk or Datadog. Um, and this actually was added into our installation to add this extra, uh, add the extra processors to not for the maximum metric set. So even though we don't use it in our pipeline, it is in the configuration. So it's still really easy for users to add, um, to create a pipeline that get all those metrics out, but still undergo the same transformations that we have configured for our system. So are you saying the metrics pipeline, uh, part of the Glue Ulta collector is customizable through the installation process when user install uh, Glue Mesh? Yes. Yep. So th they can they can customize any of the configuration to add new pipelines and new receivers, processors. And um, I'll let Renor show this because he's going to actually show where that can be done. Um, but yeah, okay. no, they can they can, can customize all of it. Um, so Very cool. Yeah. Right before I hand it over to Renor, I just want to dig in to blow these out just a little bit. Uh, the metrics gateway and the OTEL collector and show the most relevant components of each one that are configured. Um, so for the glue OTEL collector, starting on the receiver side, it's called the Prometheus receiver. I find this receiver like very cool because um, if you actually look at the implementation code, they've pulled in the Prometheus open source code and are running the exact discovery and scraper mechanisms. Um, so there's, if you want to take like existing Prometheus like scrape config and just drop it into the OTEL collector config, you can do that and it just works and it works exactly the same, um, but it just allows you to like propagate up and centralize them all so you can write it at one place. Um, but I find that very cool. Then um, we have our processors, which are a custom one that is doing some in like custom transformations for application attributes, which is relabeling filter, which is dropping. Um, the last thing I want to touch on is the open telemetry protocol, which, uh, if you look at, if you're looking in the documentation is referred to as OTLP, um, very commonly and OT OTLP is important because it's the language that the whole collector talks in. So once it's received and data is like brought into the collector, it's autumn, it's immediately, um, converted to this format. So if you're actually like building your own processor receiver exporter, you're going to be working with this, um, this, uh, like proto API to begin with. Um, but it's all, it's all public. If you end up like wanting to make your own, um, own uh, listener for OTLP, you even could. Um, so, but it's just an important thing to discuss because this is a very, very core exporter receiver for open telemetry. And you'll see on the gateway side, it's OTLP receiver. Um, and so if you're talking between um, collectors ever, this is pretty much the de facto way to do it mm -hmm. um, because it's it has resi like resiliency features are very well supported. Um, it's secure because it's gRPC. And so this is, and, it, and it's the least work because it's like not transforming the data back to anything again. And so it's it's definitely the de facto way to like, to move information from one collector to the other, which is exactly what we're doing with this line, like right here. Yeah. Um, Thank you so much for explaining this because <laughs> I've been uh, got hung up on the previous slides where you had the premises as the receiver. I was like, that's Ultra run its own premises. 
right? Can you, you kind of explain it's pulling some of the code uh, from the Prometheus project so it can pull data uh, and script the endpoint. So that was very cool. Yeah, and it is a little confusing when you first look at the docs there. And yeah. Prometheus, and you're like, wait, is that is that reading from a Prometheus? It's it's a little hard to tell. Once you go in there, yeah, you yeah, actually, yeah. You read it, you're like, oh, this is the scraper, like it runs it itself. Um, but it is a little confusing when you first look at it. The exporter is actually just hosting the metrics and making them available to scrape from an actual Prometheus server or another hotel collector, I guess, if you want to. Um, but so yeah, from uh, from here, I think I'll hand it over to uh, Renor for his demo. Oh, yeah. And there's some results, right, between the old architecture and the new architecture. Maybe you talk about it after the demo, Reno. Uh, results? Uh, results in what sense? Like the performance improvement or anything? I thought oh, so um, we didn't show, like, the performance improvement, like, just how much we can scale and what we can support for our customers. Um, we didn't do a comparison uh, because see. it would be sort of, like, comparing two different things. Like, previously... We would have to scale out like all our components now it's just one small component so in a lot of ways um the auto collector would win especially considering flexibility supporting multiple backends and so on yeah but Not what you will see is uh, like uh, how much we can scale and how much uh, traffic for metrics and as well the traffic that generates that metrics we can support for our customers yeah. All right. Uh, we actually have a question in the chat. Uh, let's say hi to Moreno. Thanks so much for dropping by. And uh, we have a question from Joe. This looks like a really cool setup. Thank you. We are exporting metrics and logs to an external service. Would it be possible to configure exporters for the management cluster as well? Yes. Yeah. Yep. And uh, that is a less, not an architecture we talked about here, um, but also you can install the collector in the form of the daemon set as well. So if you wanna use that, because daemon sets do scale a little better if you're running like a big cluster, if you wanna use that, you can install it like that and use that to export the data. Um, but the gateway could also be used if you wanna reuse that component. Yeah, and let's keep this question in mind. While we go through the demo, we can answer this as well. What would be as well interesting to know is if Joe is a user of Blue Mesh, then we could even show some of the concrete Blue Mesh configurations for that. Yeah, so Joe, thanks so much for the question. If there are any particular area you want us to focus on through the demo, please comment in the chat and we'll get to them. Thank you. So, now let's go to the demo. The demo has already the environment set up. It's uh, four clusters. One of those is hosting the management plane. And the other three clusters are data planes. Each has four nodes um, in which we have deployed the auto collector as a daemon set. And it's pulling the metrics from all the local workloads from the node in which it is running and pushing those to the metrics gateway, which is deployed as a deployment in the management cluster and then Prometheus is pulling those and keeping those, storing those for longer term. And in the end, our UI is uh, using this information from Prometheus to show like how, how much workload we have between our, how much traffic we have between our workloads and so on. So let's switch over to Lens and let's keep this to the side so that we can through. Let's start by starting from Prometheus and then walk down up to the actual workload, which is generating those uh, metrics. So here's Lens, and it's a nice ID for like showing anything in Kubernetes, and it makes it a little easier for the demos. Prometheus is in the management plane, so we will switch to the management cluster. Um, we deploy these in the Glue Mesh namespace, so let's go to Glue Mesh. And here we have Prometheus and as well the Glue metrics. Let's start with Prometheus. I will port forward this. And then we can see in the UI the workloads and the traffic and so on. Sorry, I'm changing the layout to make your screen bigger. OK. So um, we let this running for 24 hours or even longer, but we will look only at the 24 hours. 
to make sure that this is actually pulling from the matrix gateway. This is like always uh, with Prometheus, you can go to targets and you can make sure that it is pulling from your job. In our case, this job is pulling from the matrix gateway in the port 1991. So if it's doing that, it means that the matrix gateway is exposing those in 1991. And let's remember to check this when we get there. The next thing that we can do is we can just make sure like a simple hello world test, like are the metrics really coming here? We see that the metrics are already here. So we verified this step. Now let's go lower to the metrics gateway. The first thing that we want to check is that the metrics are being exposed in 1991. And then we will check how these are received from the auto collectors from the data planes. Switching over to here, um, let's go to workloads. We said this is a deployment. It's configured with a config map. So under config map, we find the global metrics gateway config. And these are like what Josh um, explained to us. Here's the receiver, here is the processor, and here is the exporter. And as we see, we are exporting everything in port 1991. And the default path for metrics is uh, forward slash metrics. So we don't have to write that. But if you want to change it, you can configure that as well. So now let's step-by-step step look at all of these components. This one is already self-explanatory. It's exposing metrics on that port. Which metrics, the ones which are received, transformed, and then made available on this port, which Prometheus is queried. So in the site of receivers, we have the OTLP, um, so the Open Telemetry Protocol, which is using gRPC. It could be as well HTTP, but we use gRPC. Um, which is listening for traffic coming in for metrics which are being pushed into this port, 4317. It has a maximum message size of 12 megabytes and then the certificates to authenticate itself to the clients. Additionally, it has as well a Prometheus receiver, which means that it's another way to get metrics into the auto collector. What this is doing, it's just scraping its own uh, telemetry in the port 8080. 8080. So uh, quite a simple receiver. And as you see, this is like the, uh, configure, the simple configuration that you can drag and drop from what you had in Prometheus and use it here. With a small difference, like um, in Prometheus, you can use just a dollar sign. But when you are drag and dropping and using um, like configuration from Prometheus, you would have to escape this dollar sign with double dollar sign. This is an environment variable. That's why it's, it doesn't need to double dollar sign. But if you add something specific, and we will see it later on, for Prometheus, you have to escape it with uh, two dollar signs. Mm. After that, we have uh, two processors, uh, batching those metrics that are pulled together, and then as well, the memory limiter, if it ever is almost getting to the point of exceeding memory, so that we start to drop metrics and not get the pod killed. All of these wouldn't really have much or bring any value if we don't combine these in a pipeline. And here's the pipeline. Here we have the metrics pipeline, which is receiving through OTLP and Prometheus. It's processing those received metrics with these two processors. And then it's exporting those in Prometheus format in the port 1991, which is then collected by Prometheus, as we showed here. Good. So now if we are receiving metrics in this port, it means that we need a public IP address uh, so that we can, so that all the hotel collectors can push the metrics over here. So to make sure that we have the public IP address, we just have a service. Here it is. And this is the public IP address. Now let's switch over to one of the client clusters, the, the data plane clusters. Here, if we go to daemon sets and then in the glue mesh namespace, you'll see that we have the glue matrix collector agent, which has four replicas, so one per node. And we have three clusters, each for repli four nodes, meaning that in total there are 12 nodes. Um, and this is as well configured simply with a config map. And it's the same image. It's just that the configuration changes. Here's the receiver. It's using Prometheus for scraping. This is the first scrape job, which is scraping all the mesh workloads. And then if we look into this, we have one of the labels. So then you ask, like, are we scraping the port 15020? 
Um, and that's the case because the name of the port uh, is matching these are gaps. So in the end, as soon as they specify this name, we will be scraping it. And the, yes, it's the, the, the port in which Istio is exposing the, yeah, the thank you for the agent. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah, that is yeah. very cool. So basically, you can configure a bunch of those things you want to script. And the workload, Saika, is just one of them. Exactly. So, um, and then here is the double escape. Like when we create those regexes and we take one group and we want to use it, usually in Prometheus, you would just use dollar sign one. Um, when you paste it here, you just have to keep in mind to add another dollar sign so that it escapes it and it doesn't think that it's an environment variable or something similar. If we check this one here, here we see the usage as an environment variable where we specify that we want to select all the pods that are within the same uh, Kubernetes node that the auto collector itself is. This is how we make sure that we are scraping only the workloads. So now if we scroll down, we have other static configuration for scraping like the Istio D matrix. Let's skip over this and get to the processors. Here is our own custom processor and then we, have, we are filtering to the minimum of the metrics so that we don't like overload Prometheus and it drops metrics that would be important just because it's full. So we are limiting it to only what we need to show all the service to service traffic in our GlueMesh dashboard. And then we are dropping some attributes that we don't need. And we get up to the point of the exporter. So where we are exporting, we are using OTLP to push the metrics over to the metrics gateway. And then so the, that is the gateway's uh, virtual IP, like service exactly. IP address. Okay. Yeah. And we use as well the server name indication so that the handshake, TLS handshake is successful. Mm -hmm. All of these, again, wouldn't have or bring any value unless they are put together in a pipeline. And here we are defining the pipeline. So we received the metrics using a Prometheus scraper. Then we are processing it by using the memory limiter, the batching. We drop all the metrics that we don't need. We drop all the extra labels that we don't need. We apply our own transformations, and then we are pushing those to the metrics gateway. So this is how this comes together. So there was the question by Joe, like, what if we want to push to another backend? Or what if we want to push other metrics? Like maybe you don't want to drop and reduce it to a minimum, and you want to push the full data set. So actually what it would mean, and I will just copy this, uh, open a new window, means that you would have to define a new, let's say you're happy with the metrics that you receive. You just want to export those to, uh, let's say to Datadoc. That's a nice example. So let's go over to the exporters. Here's the exporter. Then we would have to define a new exporter. Um, as soon as you want to do that, the first step is really to just go and open the hotel contrib repository where everybody contributes their own components, which could be exporters, let's zoom in a little, which can be exporters, processors, and receivers. So in this case, we want to export to Datadoc. So let's open this. Do we have a Datadoc exporter? We do. And as you see, there are a lot of exporters. So you are not limited to just a handful. Like most of the um, metrics providers and solutions already have their own exporters here. So here is the Datadoc exporter. Usually all the components have quite good documentation on how to use them. Um, Datadoc apparently has as well the official documentation page where you can read. But what I quite often do as well is I just check the test data where they specify different configs on how you can like configure your this specific component. Like in this case, they are specifying this one. So let's copy it. Let's copy the name as well. Get over here, paste it, and then let's invent this correctly. This API is not um, mandatory, so this is optional. You would use this only if you have like two components that have the same name. Like for example, if you want another Prometheus receiver, then we would have to add some other ID to, to, to make a difference between those. So in this case, 
we called it API. We can drop this, we can keep this, let's keep it. Um, you would change this to the host name and then your API key, the site, and so on. So after you create this exporter, you would come here, take this pipeline, the metrics pipeline, duplicate this here. And here as well, you have to rename it, like export to data doc. We said that we are happy with the receiver. Let's say we want the full data set, we drop this. Uh, let's not drop the labels as well. Let's say in this case, you don't need our custom processor, which is specifically for our UI. And you want to export to, oops, wrong paste. So you want to export to Datadog and that's it. So now when you start, your metrics will be pushed through OTLP to our metrics gateway. And in addition, those would go to Datadog um, as you configured the exporter above here. So in case if uh, you are a Gloomash user, we made sure to expose all of these options of creating additional pipelines and additional receivers. So you would prepare all of those within a Helm values file. And then you could like specify an added, uh, another exporter, which would be almost like copy pasting this into the location in the proper flag. So that's how you would use it in Gumash. Well, now, this is really cool. Does it require restart of the auto collector? Does it require additional installation or refresh of the Docker image for the auto collector? Yeah, so right now, um, we don't recommend people to do those changes within the config map. Like we don't want people to do this change and go apply it because in the next upgrade, of Gloomash, they would uh, revert these changes, they would be overridden. Um, so what we recommend is to integrate this into the Gloomash installation okay. and then just apply it. Right now, it would still require to get bounced, like that the pod needs to be restarted. But in the future, we will, like, we have already an issue in our board to just add the hash so that we trigger a rollout whenever the config map changes. Okay, makes sense. Well, very cool. Thank you so much yeah. for explaining exactly how that could potentially be done. Yeah, so now we solved this process. Like this was the first part, like the, the, the walkthrough of how the metrics go from the workload. They are scraped with the Prometheus scraper, they are pushed here, and then they are scraped by Prometheus, and those are kept within Prometheus and visualized in our dashboard. So the next thing that we can check and that we want to check is like, we as well solve the flexibility, which was quite nice with a regular use case. What if you want to add uh, more exporters? Uh, that's how you would do it. Um, if you want to have the same, you would just have to replace to apply this here and you wouldn't need a second pipeline. That's as well an option. Uh, we left it this way because we want to reduce the amount of metrics. So that said, uh, the next part that we want to cover is like scalability. So let's go back to Prometheus and let's see like how much we were able to handle. Oh, I think it's here. So, and I see, well, I will try to be as fast as I can. So if we sum all the Istio requests metric, like the total of requests that we got, we will get quite a huge number, which doesn't mean much because this could have been running for years. So let's just find the rate per second. So to do so, let's get the rate and get this every two minutes. Um, so this is like 335,000 requests are coming in. So this is the amount. If we zoom out, let's go to uh, zoom out to one day we will see that it's this amount that we were receiving through the entire time. It's a little slow because it has a lot of data. But this is the, the, the amount. It was sometimes going up and down, but as we see, like the minimum is still over 335,000 of metrics per second. And this is not the only type of metric. We have as well the buckets which are for the duration requests, which are even more intensive because you have more buckets and then the data points fall into more metrics. And as you see, this would like 
fail, it would take more time to resolve. So let's switch over to the table format that we get just one value about the number of metrics that we are handling every second. So this is like four, uh, let's let's check this step by step. Like it's 4 million, 4.7 million of uh, metrics, uh, data points of metrics through these, um, through the buckets. So that's the amount that it can handle. And th these are not the only metrics. We saw uh, way more metrics. There are metrics for auto, metrics for the Istio control plane and so on, but these are the key ones. And these are just the past two minutes? These are, no, these are like uh, every second, not the past two minutes. This is like every second. Okay, every second. Yeah. So what we saw is, let's open a calculator. We had 335,000 uh, requests per second. We multiplied this for 60, 60 seconds and then we 60 minutes and then 24 hours. And this is the, the number, which is quite difficult to read, that we handled for a day, it's like 4 million and then 8 billion, 28 billion wow. of requests that you, you would get. But you would have to split this by two because you always get, for one request, one would go through the Ingress gateway and another would go through the workload. So it, it, we create two metrics every time. Um, multiple metrics, but at least uh, in each case, we, we, we have to double it, but it's still quite an amazing number. Um, meaning that, let's go back to this 335,000. Let's say one request is generated, is going to two workloads, it means that we can handle up to 165,000 of requests. Another very important thing to check is, let's keep this in mind, um, is how many workloads we can support. Like for that, we can count all the different destinations. Count, count. Um, so is your request total by destination workload ID. And we see that we are currently pulling the metrics for 3,758 uh, workloads. So let's delete this. Divide this by 12 because we have three clusters, each with four nodes. So it's about 310 um, workloads per node, which is more than Google Cloud and uh, Azure support in Kubernetes. Like you have a limit of around 250 pods per node. This way we ensure that we are supporting any number of workloads within a node when you run that uh, daemon set. So for, for the Hotel collector, it's very easy to support all the workloads that you need within a cluster. In our case, we were deploying less workloads, but we were mocking those and generating more traffic for those workloads, um, which were mimicking real Istio workloads. And with that, we can go back to the presentation. Like, let's fill quickly some data in. So we, with one hotel replica, we were handling 310 workloads, uh, and then and even more than that. Uh, and then for requests, this was across all clusters, not just for one replica, we were able to handle 167,000 requests per second, considering you have a two hops when a request comes into your cluster. So, and what's important and what puts these into perspective is how much CPU and memory do, does mm -hmm. one single auto replica use? Like if you if it uses three CPUs, that's already too much because this is replicating in every node, and that's that's a lot. So let's find out that out. In the here in the cluster, we already have the uh, the solution for measuring like the cube Prometheus stack, which is deployed in the monitoring namespace. The services here is Grafana. Let's run this. Hmm. Interesting. Let's stop. Let's start this again. Okay. So yeah, it's admin, and then the default password is prompt operator. Now under pros. So here we go to pods. 
we switch to the glue mesh namespace and then let's select one of the replicas in this cluster so it's a little over 300 millicores per second this is the cpu usage now if we scroll down we will see that in the memory side we are using approximately one gigabyte of memory which considered the amount of load that we are mm -hmm. applying for every replica that's quite a lot so it's like 320 millicores and it's one gigabyte of memory and as you see there is a lot of room to scale up and you can even configure higher amounts um, but this ensures us that it will be able to handle the traffic for any of our customers and it's already so currently we just released it and it's in in beta but we are already deploying it the field engineers are deploying it for some customers and they are happy that's awesome this is like super super impressive to calculate this in a live cluster you know with these many requests and uh, you know dive into how much cpu and memory is very yeah. good and that was running for 24 hours as well like it, it didn't have any, any drop so it's perfect so and lastly like and this is probably the place that uh we had most of the conversation um with josh like we wanted to expose this in a way that is as simple as possible um from from glue mesh 2.2 you can very just specify this flag metrics gateway dot enabled and set it to true and if you want to support legacy metrics pipeline you can either keep it enabled if you want to if you have multiple clusters and you want a gradual rollout you can have both of them running at the same time or if you are just making a new installation or you don't worry about some metrics being dropped you can disable the legacy metrics pipeline in the agent side so in the data plane clusters as well you would just specify the ip of the metrics gateway and you would enable the metrics collector and all of it would work out of the box you wouldn't have to um to worry much about it and this is as well uh, thanks to the um, charts that are provided by auto, the auto community which are quite good and you can very easily extend those to meet your needs and with that, uh, these are the resources. Mm, you can just browse all of these. Most likely, we will add those in the show notes. So with that, I hand back over to you. Yeah. That's awesome. So folks, if you have any questions, uh, please type in. If not, uh, we're going to wrap up the session because it's been a really good session for me personally to learn Open Telemetry Collector, how does it solve our scalability challenges. And the demo was awesome to go through like the configurations of receiver, uh, how to configure the exporter, how to set up the pipeline. So that's really, really cool and also see the scalability number. All right, I guess I don't see any questions coming. Uh, well, let's go ahead and wrap up. I would really love to thank you, both of you, Reno and Josh, and particularly Reno, I know it's the evening, your time. So thank you so much for doing this live stream to both of you. Uh, folks, if you guys find this live stream interesting, uh, feel free to reach out to us in the solo community or go to our uh, uh, GitHub for the hood and uh, open up a uh, open up a ticket for any future suggestion you may have and also give us a thumbs up. Uh, we are super grateful for everyone who watched our past live stream and subscribe to our channel and click on the like button for our live stream so thank you so much everyone for joining us and uh, happy learning and we will be back in two weeks uh, see you guys in the next episode thanks so much okay. well.